your home for the NFL. Coming up on NFL, I believe it or not, the Packers and Cardinals have just scored again. What a wild finish to wild card weekend. So many records were set. It's official. You're looking at a former USC head coach and the new Seattle Seahawks head coach. But is it a good marriage? And what did we really learn from Wild Card Weekend? We break them all down on NFL Live. Welcome to NFL Live, presented by Pizza Hut. And now it's official. The new head coach of the Seattle Seahawks is Pete Carroll. He becomes the eighth head coach in Hawks' 34-year history, leaving USC after a nine-year run leading the Trojans. The Seahawks are his third NFL team where he's a head coach. History suggests he was better with kids. He had some success in four seasons in the NFL with the Jets and the Patriots, but nothing like the incredible run he had at USC. He was one and done in New York, but later took the Patriots to the playoffs twice. Carroll was replaced in Foxborough by Bill Belichick, who did a little better than he did. And with that, we welcome you into NFL Live. So glad you are here with us as we continue to churn through the postseason. Trey Wingo, Tom Jackson is here, as well as Trent Dilfer. All right, let, let's deal with this Pete Carroll situation. It's official now, Trent. 33 and 31 as a head coach in the NFL. Is he the right fit this time around in Seattle? Well, he's got all the ingredients. Yes. I mean, he's got the rock star personality. <laughs> he's got the good looks. He's charismatic, and he does a great job bringing energy to the situation. But there's really two things that are going to define Pete Carroll's success in the National Football League this time around. Number one, who is he working with on the personnel side? They need a strong personnel person in Seattle to help reshape this organization, get rid of some of the old, infuse it with some new young talent. And then the most important thing for any head coach to do, they have to str hire strong assistant coaches. You are defined by who you hire in this league. It's the assistant coaches that really push the buttons yes. of the players, yes. implement the schemes, and ultimately affect most the direction your team's going and how well you're going to play on Sundays. Absolutely. And then, of course, the GM still yet to be determined. More on that coming up in just a little bit. But, Tom, before Pete Carroll could be hired, the Seahawks had to comply with the Rooney rule yes. to make sure a minority candidate like the Vikings' Leslie Frazier does get an interview and a chance for the job. Now, speaking to our Rachel Nichols over the mm -hmm. weekend, mm -hmm. Commissioner Roger Goodell said he believed the Seahawks not only fulfilled the rule of the Ro the law of the, and the letter of the Rooney rule, mm -hmm. but also the spirit of the Rooney rule. Well, Do you believe that? Whether I believe it or not is not important. I don't know that you can know this if the spirit of the Rooney rule has been applied. I think that you can know if a team complied to the letter of the rule, where you have to interview a minority candidate before you do a hiring of a head coach or a GM. I think that uh, when you start talking about applying the, the, the spirit of the rule, you're talking about really what's in the heart and the soul of an owner and who he wants running his football team. Now, when you look at this situation, all indications were that Pete Carroll was going to take this job. Right. Mm. Leslie Frazier gets interviewed. Uh, does it seem like it may be a sham? We are never going to know that. Mm. I think that if you're Leslie Frazier, you have to walk into that room believing that you have an opportunity to get that job. I will say this. We are better off with this rule than without, and I think we have seen the positives come from it since it has been uh, app apply. Absolutely. Although you're right, though, you have to believe they wouldn't have fired Jim Morris so quickly if they didn't feel really good about the chances. We know we know who our coach is going to be of really getting Pete good. Carroll, and then he wouldn't have resigned from USC before they made it official That's that he's going to be the That's Seahawks correct. head coach. Okay, Seahawks did not make the Wild Card Weekend. As for action on the field, well, it sure ended with a bang between the Packers and the Cardinals. Listen, give the NFL credit. They saved the best from last. This was not the blowout that the Packers had week 17, 33 to 7. And right away, we knew it wasn't going to be the same game. On Aaron Rodgers' first pass attempt in his postseason history, it's an oopsie. He throws it. It's deflected. And Dominique Rodgers-Cromartie picks him off. That led to a touchdown and put him up 7-0. 
next Packers drive. Trent, it didn't get any better. Carlos Dansby tipped that other one, and he strips this one. And this is a great play by Carlos Dansby. Really, the Cardinals only made three plays on defense all night, and Dansby was in on all three of them. If they're only making three, he made the right three. Yep. Trust me on that one. And that possession led to another touchdown. This time, Kurt Warner. Remember, no end. Quan Bolden in this game to early do set. Up the middle. Touchdown. Really quickly, they're up 14-0. Now, Cardinals opening drive of the second half. Kurt Warner buying time, and he's going to find a guy who's never really wide open. Larry Fitzgerald, wide open, 33 yards for the score. Tommy, how did he get so wide open? Well, great job of Kurt stepping through the pocket, but you see the contact right there. It puts Woodson on the ground. Fitzgerald may, able to maintain his balance. That's an easy walk to the end zone. 21-point lead, but the Packers didn't quit. Greg Jennings, come on! I thought they outlawed Stickham in the Lester Hayes era. What a catch, Trent. Tommy, come on, man! Come this on, is man. ridiculous! That's as good as catch as we're going to see all year long. Great play by Greg Jennings. Unbelievable. And not the best in this game for him, perhaps. Packers down 31-17. Surprise on sides, and they go for it, and they recover it. Underwood gets it. So now they got a little mojo here. And Aaron scrambling. By the way, he threw for 300 yards in the second half alone of this game to Jordy Nelson. It's a one-score game. Did I say it's a one-score game? Shoot, my bad. Make it a two-score game. Larry Fitzgerald again, Tommy. Well, this is a great throw. Kurt said he was trying to throw it out of the end zone. That's offensive interference. Yeah. Defensively, I got to tell you that, but what a great one-hand catch by Larry. There were other questionable non-calls in this game as well. Oh, we're going to get into that. Yes, we will. <laughs> Fourth quarter, it's 38-31. Rodgers to Donald. Driver, and he gets down to the one-yard line. A 28-yard game. Hey, look, shocker in this game, a running play. John Goon ties it up at 38. We are back to square. But the Cards got the ball back. And Warner over the middle. Again, no Anquan Bolden. It's Steve Breston, 17 yards. Cards go back up 45 to 38. But the Packers trying to respond, and they did. This is a perfect throw and an unbelievable catch, Trent, by Greg Jennings. This is one of the best plays we've seen all season long. A phenomenal throw by Aaron Rodgers and an equally spectacular catch by Greg Jennings. So, of course, with all this offense, the best way to tie the game is to go to a linebacker who is now a tight end in Spencer Havener. It's tied at 45, but we all said the same thing watching the game. They left too much time on the clock. Warner to Breston again over the middle, 24 yards and a first down. Three plays later, it's early Doucette. Woodson tries to strip the ball. He gets inside the 20. It's a chip shot, Trent. But what did you say when this kick was going up? A little fast. It's like a golf swing. A little fast from the top. He's fast in his approach. Dead pull. Smothered it left. We are going to overtime. Bad news for Arizona. Pack won the toss. Good news for Arizona. The Pack can't convert on a wide open Greg Jennings that would have won the game. More bad news for Green Bay. Two plays later, third and five. Pressure. Adams hits him. The ball goes right to Carlos Dansby again. And the Cardinals win, of all things, on a defensive touchdown. Michael Adams comes in, strips the ball away, and that allows Dansby to take it back to the house. Unbelievable game. Summarizing this one could take some time. So we'll just sort of go through it briefly. Highest scoring postseason game in NFL history. They had 62 first downs. That's also a record. 11 different players scored. Kurt Warner joins Daryl LaMonica as the only quarterbacks to have a pair of five touchdown games in the postseason. And Rodgers, the only man ever to throw for 300 yards in the second half of a postseason game. Look, as much fun as this game was to watch and talk about and discuss, there were those plays you saw at the end there, Trent, where it sure looked like Michael Adams grabbed and not only had hold of Aaron Rodgers' face mask, but pulled it down. You saw the brim of the helmet go down, which would be the 15-yard penalty that wasn't called. And there was also a head-to-head -head shot between Aaron Rodgers and Bertrand Berry. How much does that or those non-calls take away from the thrill and the wonder of this game? Well, I think we need to be careful there. We don't want to take away from the luster of this football game. This is a wonderful football game, but I think it's important to note there was a lot of inconsistencies in the referees' calls and no calls in this football game. And it really starts on this touchdown play from Kurt Warner. Now, there's a hold on this play on Colin Jenkins, but they call the hand to the face of Kurt Warner. And on the same play here, Larry Fitzgerald gets way As too Tommy physical said. <laughs> in the back end. That's offensive pass series. Now, this is a second and 10 in overtime. Now, a hold was called once, but look at that. That's helmet-to-helmet -helmet contact on the quarterback. 
That should be a 15-yard penalty. This play would have been redone because the hold. And then the third down play, this is a blatant face mask. It's a nice play by Mike Adams to knock the ball loose. But at the end of the day, that is a personal foul, and the Packers should have kept the ball. Now, the issue, once again, we don't want to take away from the game, but Tommy, yes. you know it's coming. We got glamorous quarterbacks this next week. They blow on those quarterbacks. Six. It's going to be six it, shooter flags it, coming it, out. It's going to be 15 yards. You, you've looked at the emphasis that they put on roughing the passer, on hitting the quarterback the entire season for 17 weeks. You look at the list of quarterbacks that you have next, next week, the Favs, the Romos and company, you are looking at referees who will give a lot of added attention right. to those guys and any contact that you make with them. And that face mask, there is no inadvertent face mask. Right. So once you grab that face mask, that's 15 yards, period. Yeah, and, and you said wonderful you game, go down. wonderful game, yeah. luster of the game. Only if you're an offensive player. Yeah. <laughs> only if you only if you're an offensive player. Or, or Carlos Dansby. Or Carlos. Dansby. <laughs> Those are the That's only correct. ways. Because Carlos Dansby certainly lived up to his end of the bargain. But I guess the question now, as we move forward here, and Green Bay season is done. Arizona goes to New Orleans. Can they put up that same kind of performance against the Saints? I, I don't think so. I, I think that New Orleans is much more assignment-oriented uh, than the Green Bay Packers. And you have a guy like Darren Sharper in that defensive backfield. Yes, uh, sometimes I think he can be a liability in terms of his coverage, but he will guess, he will put people in the right position, uh, possession, and he will make plays for them and put people in position where they can make plays. Well, and listen, we didn't mention Kurt Warner's passer rating in this game. Uh, he only had four incompletions and five touchdowns. It so I'm assuming good. it was really good. <laughs> but Trent, you know as a quarterback, passer rating is an ambiguous stat that's yep. hard to quantify. But you have found a way through you, the guys that you played with and were coached by that there is a way to take a stat like passer rating and make it mean something on the other side of the ball. It's a great stat to show you how you're playing defensive football because the stat is heavily weighed on efficiency, completion percentage, uh, big plays, yards per completion, and then touchdown interception formula. So if you can, as a defense, limit those things from a passer, you effectively win the battle in the passing game. Now, the one thing the Saints do, they do a great job defending the opponent's passer. They limit to a very low quarterback rating because this team is built to play from the lead, get points on early, and then force the other team to pass the ball. They do a great job with their blitz schemes, creating pressures, forcing the quarterback into bad decisions. So if Breeze scores 45 points, they should win. There you go. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, oh, for sure. <laughs> you just have to boil it down that simply. I'm a linebacker, don't you? Well, and actually, the onus may be on Drew Breeze because in the last two uh, games that the Saints actually tried to win during their three-game losing streak, they only scored 17 points in the loss to Dallas mm -hmm. and also 17 points in the loss to the Tampa Bay Bucks. Uh, lots more coming here on this edition of NFL Live. Pete Carroll is in place in Seattle, but are there other coaching changes still to come, like in Jacksonville or in Oakland? We've got the very latest there. Plus, did what did Sunday's game in New England tell us not only about the Ravens, but also about the Patriots? Sign up to the ESPN America newsletter and be the first to know all about the best matchups for the month ahead. Get the latest news from the players and the teams who are making the headlines. Be the first to view the exclusive offers from our online shop and win lots of prizes in our exclusive competitions and promotions. All from the only channel dedicated to North American sports. Visit ESPNAmerica.com for more details and scheduling information. Verlander has great stuff again tonight. Swing and a miss. He got him on strike. 94 mile an hour fastball. Whenever you throw 100 miles an hour on top of that, that's, I mean, that's just going to, you're just going to be unhittable. An absolute gem of a win here tonight. You look at his last three, 23 innings, 11 hit, 31 strikeouts. What an outing for Justin Verlander. Career high, 13 strikeouts today. Trying to go quickly. The throw down field is for Reggie. He's got it 40. Touchdown. Manning looks, pops, throws to the end zone. Touchdown, Marvin Harrison. Peyton on first down. They air it out deep intended for Reggie Wayne. Reggie's got it. That was a perfect throw. Manning takes the snap. Sets up. Throws down field. Open is a die. Touchdown, Joseph and I. NFL on ESPN America. Well, as we told you at the top of the show, Pete Carroll is now officially the new head coach in Seattle. Here's what Todd Lewicki, Seahawks CEO, had to say. We're excited to add Pete as our coach. 
He brings a great passion for winning and a positive attitude that is contagious. We now turn our full attention to the hiring process for a general manager. Our intended structure is for Pete and the new GM to work in a collaborative capacity on football matters. All right, so for more on this, uh, let's say hello to the man who has the best texting thumbs in the business, ESPN insider Adam Schefter. Adam, how close is Seattle to nailing down a GM, and, and who's emerging as a forefront here? Well, Trey, they have four candidates coming to Seattle this week for interviews. They have John Schneider of the Green Bay Packers, Omar Khan of the Pittsburgh Steelers, Floyd Reese of the New England Patriots, and they also have... One other candidate, Mark Ross of the New York Giants. Those four will be in this week to interview with the Seattle Seahawks. They'll then make the decision. And each of these men, whoever does get the job, has been told that he will work in conjunction with P. Carroll. And he will be given broad powers and control of this organization along with P. Carroll. Because that was something that P. Carroll assured the Fritz Pollard Alliance that would not happen. That he would not have full control of the Seahawks organization. So it will be a tandem work in Seattle. Okay, let's go to some head Correct. coach and we're still not sure about their futures. What's the latest you're hearing on Tom Cable? Will he be back as head coach of the Raiders? It looks bleak right now, Trey. Al Davis has been doing research into other head coaching candidates, and that would be a sign that he could be making a change. Of course, at this time of the year, Al Davis often makes research into other candidates. So, again, this could go any way, but I think the feeling right now around the league is that Tom Cable is not likely to survive. He met last Monday with Al Davis, the Raiders owner, in which time Al Davis picked his brain about the Raiders roster and his thoughts on certain players. They're supposed to meet later today, at which point Tom Cable could learn of his fate. But it's also possible that Al Davis could sit back, take some more time, decide who he'd like to hire, and then inform Tom Cable that he'd let him go at that point in time. All right, then let's go to Jacksonville. Jack Del Rio's Jags lost their last four down the stretch. Is he going to pay the price for that? Jaguars owner Wayne Weaver spent last week talking to all the assistant coaches and many of the people in the building getting answers about Jack Del Rio. He heard good, he heard bad, and he heard ugly. Now Wayne Weaver is scheduled to sit down with Jack Del Rio on Tuesday, and he wants to have some serious answers to some of the questions that he has and will pose to Jack Del Rio on Tuesday. Again, you continue to hear Jack Del Rio's name mentioned in connection to the USC job as well. I think Jaguars wouldn't have any problem if Jack Del Rio could wind up getting that job. They'd be off the hook for the $15 million that they owe him. But Jack Del Rio and Wayne Weaver right now are scheduled to meet Tuesday. I think the feeling right now is that Del Rio could be safe, but this is far from being a certain situation. All right, Adam, as always, thanks. Your television time is over. Go back to texting. It is what you do best. Thank you, Trey. Lots more coming on NFL Live. The man's he's a, he's a unbelievable. No, he's great on TV. Okay. Frank's out more information than anybody. How far can Baltimore go as Trent throws me under the bus? It's always oh, up to have uh, Plus, what was the best of the playoff weekend? Trent Dilfer no longer working on NFL Live. <laughs> Tweet that, Adam. Watch the very best live sports action online with the new and improved ESPN360.com. Get access to over 1,000 NHL games, what a shot. including the playoffs and the 2010 Stanley Cup Finals. The traffic, scores. Get the best NCAA action, including over 300 college football games. Are you kidding me? And 300 college basketball games, all live and on demand. Simply choose a package that suits you. To watch the NHL or college sports online this season, simply go to www.espn360.com. That's as explosive as, as I've seen. DeMarcus Ware, wow. And you've seen him explosive before. Ware has come and got him. It's been a marathon for DeMarcus Ware, and he finally got there. Flushed out. Ware chasing. Ware grabbing. Ware sacking. Where's coming and where's got it? Where's got it? Three today. Hit, carried, gobbled up by Demarcus Ware. <laughs> NFL on ESPN America. Monday Night Football on ESPN America. Join us every Monday night for live NFL. Get ready for the big game with Monday Night Countdown. Then it's showtime as two more teams step onto the gridiron. What a play! For the Monday Night Showdown. No way! Touchdown, Arizona! Monday Night Football on ESPN America. Go to ESPNAmerica.com for schedules and information.
for the first time since the Jimmy Carter presidency, folks. Patriots fans woke up today dealing with a home loss in the playoffs. It's been a while. Over 11,333 days. Of course, it certainly doesn't help the cause, but on the first play from scrimmage, Tom, Ray Rice goes 83 yards. You know, this is how you establish what you want to do. We knew that the Ravens wanted to run the football, and when you start off with an 83-yard touchdown, that's success. And it only gets worse on the next possession for the Patriots. Their first one, Terrell Suggs does this, Trent. Makes a great effort, and I've said this. The Ravens don't want to play in a football game. They want to get in a brawl, and they threw big two, two big punches early and landed them both. Yeah, set up 14 points right away, and then Brady doing something we've never seen throwing late under pressure over the middle it's picked up by Chris Carr two turnovers for Brady we're not out of the first quarter Ray Rice says you know we'll take advantage of that so that's two turnovers led to 14 points he had 159 yards it's 21 to nothing before people have parked their car next patch drive second play Brady come on another interception third turnover of the quarter this one by Ed Reed, who gets it to Dewan Landry. Only the Ravens get away with this. <laughs> every other team does it. They fumble it back to the offense, but the Ravens make it happen every time. Great job by Ed Reed here. Yeah, great job also by Ray Lewis tackling that guy at the end, making sure he doesn't fumble the ball. Ed Reed, great ball hawk, comes over, safety makes the play. And it wasn't done there. Third quarter, it's 24 to seven. Ben Watson gets smacked, and there's Landry getting the interception. Four turnovers, four turnovers for Brady. The Ravens win 33 to 14. You know, now on ESPN.com, the Patriots are out of the playoffs, but is their reign as an elite team over? ESPNBoston.com has more on that. You know, it's funny, Tom, the two games we had Sunday, the late game was the future, <laughs> everything's going crazy, right. points video, everywhere. Video football. The first game was an old-fashioned butt whooping. Well, it's old school football, and this was a wonderful game to me where you get the blocking, you get the tackling, you get the hard hitting, you get the intimidation in your in your defensive backfield, where you make people respect the fact that whatever you're gonna do offensively, you're gonna suffer some pain for doing it. And I think that the Ravens right now are doing it better than anybody else in the league. I've been waiting all year to see who's gonna play defense and give their team a chance to win in the playoffs. This is the team. They are doing a great job, and everybody wants to use this formula the Ravens have used. They just play great defense, and just run the ball and be safe. Listen, this formula only works. And I'm somewhat of an expert in this. I won a Super Bowl <laughs> with, this, with this formula. It only works with great defense. Now, hear what I'm saying. Great defense. Not good defense. A lot of coaches think they can do it with just kind of good defense. You have to play great yes. defense. Can the Ravens do it again? We'll see. Well, we'll find out. But listen, just so people understand how different these, these games were, on Sunday, Joe Flacco's team won. He completed four passes. Uh, Kurt Warner's team won. He only had four incompletions. <laughs> so we're talking 180s here, the way these two teams won on Wild Card Weekend. When we continue here on NFL Live, we'll give you the very best of Sunday's Wild Card game. Stay with us. Tony and Mike. Enough said. Pardon the interruption. Weeknights on ESPN America. Well, even in the postseason, it is a Monday staple. Mm -hmm. Sunday standouts. The best we saw from Sunday's wild card games. Trent, what was the best pass? Oh, the no brainer. Aaron Rodgers. Check this out. Now he's going to his right. He's falling back. Receivers covered, and somehow he gets the diamond there. Do you know how much strength that takes? Accuracy, that's as good a throw as you're ever going to see. There's no defense for what, Trump? A perfect throw, and that's exactly <laughs> what we see. Here. There you go. That. Tommy, give me your best run. First run of the game for the Baltimore Ravens. It's like Ray it. Rice right up the gut. Look at the cut. He gets on the safety, and most guys cannot finish like this. 83 yards, and nobody on the defense. Can catch him. Yeah, that, that's what we like to call setting the tone four seconds into the game because that was pretty much it from there. Best catch, Trent. Well, this is Greg Jennings, but he makes two equally spectacular this game. We just happen to choose this one. Look at this. He catches this ball with his eyes. His eyes go to his hand. His hand follows. That is a, <laughs> that's unbelievable. I don't even understand how these guys make these types of plays. Uh, not many. And then give me the best hit, Tommy. It's Frank Walker on Ben Watson on the sideline. You see the ball thrown into coverage. And boy, what a hit he takes. Just listen. 
And that not only affects that play, that oh, affects yeah. every other play yeah. after that. You got that right. <laughs> In case you had forgotten, very brave men play this yes, game. Yes. There's a reason they wear the helmets uh, uh, in the NFL, ladies and gentlemen. Hey, don't forget, all week long here on NFL Live, we'll be looking forward to the divisional rounds. We could have some of those contrasting styles going oh, up, yes, especially yes. when the yes. Baltimore Ravens travel to Indy to take on the Indianapolis Colts. Trent, Tommy Jackson, Trey Wingo, thanks for watching. We'll see you later. None of us had ever been in a tug of war. You really couldn't close your hands. It was very raw. Very medieval. <laughs> it was pretty brutal. We were just holding on to the rope, hoping that it would end. No one guessed it would go 10 minutes. I don't even think anybody thought it might go five. But to go 16 minutes? I mean, that's ridiculous. In 1975, two weeks after the Pittsburgh Steelers defeated the Minnesota Vikings 16 to six in Super Bowl IX, the two teams met on a very different playing field. The Super Team. From the island of Oahu in Hawaii, we begin our Super Teams competition. Each team coming here with 10 athletes, and there'll be a variety of competitive events for them. ABC's first Super Teams competition, featuring the most recent Super Bowl and World Series participants, took athletes out of their comfort zone <laughs> and into a best of seven format, including an obstacle course, and even an outrigger canoe race. So the Vikings are leading the Steelers now by just about a full boat length. Calling the action were Keith Jackson and then Buffalo Bills running back, O.J. Simpson. Coming over here on the chartered flight, all the teams came over together, and there wasn't too many words said between the Steelers and the Vikings. I guess the memory of the Super Bowl isn't that far out of their mind. Viking teammates had a lot at stake. Here we had one chance to get just a little revenge, uh, to get a little pride back, and so it really meant everything to us. Oh, we knew it was a trip to Hawaii. Just kind of have fun, lay on the beach for a week and go do some uh, stupid games that we were uh, participating in. After six events, the teams were tied at three. And here we go now with a tug of war. On each side of the rope, six men nearly 1,500 pounds of humanity. The Steelers in red, Vikings in blue, would pull mightily to decide the winner. And the tug of war is underway with everything on the line. We saw them digging in. And, uh, and once I think people saw some people digging in, everybody decided to dig in. And the Pittsburgh Steelers have taken the early advantage. The match wouldn't end until the red flag crossed the water all the way to the ultimate line in the sand. They're about two yards away from beating the Minnesota Vikings, and they move it again. They had us to the point where one good pull, and we were done. We are all thinking how we were going to get this back. We could see that they couldn't really pull us across. We couldn't pull them across. Nothing was happening. At about the five or six minute mark, you start to feel pain in your arms and in your legs. You got to see some of the faces here. These guys are in agony. It was like, I got to hold on because if I let go, then I know everybody's going to let go. By this time, the hands have to be numb. I don't think any of us had exerted that amount of energy and strength for that long a period of time in any athletic way. Yeah, but the Vikings, they, they're moving back on the road. They, they look inspired. I remember Frank O'Harris, I looked over there, and he kind of just almost collapsed. And when he kind of collapsed, we gave it the big pull. Yes, I uh, definitely was exhausted. There's. There's no doubt about that. And the Vikings almost have that flag back in the center of the pool. They move it again, another six, seven precious inches. We were, in some ways, just as passionate about winning that as we were about winning the Super Bowl. Oh, it's interesting. A tug of war. <laughs> we just wanted this to be over with so we can get back to the beach fine. The Vikings are moving it. 